In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. <clears throat> Imagine to yourself someone who has committed a crime that is certain and known, and for which the penalties are very severe. It is impossible that he be declared innocent since he was clearly seen in the very act of committing the crime. It is only a matter of time before the sentence is passed and he be, he be cast into a dreadful prison. A fixed day is already appointed for his trial when he will have to stand before a judge with absolutely no chance of his being declared innocent of the crime. Now imagine that this judge, knowing well the dire straits in which the accused has put himself, calls him and says to him, <clears throat> You know well that when the day appointed for your trial comes, I, according to the full requirement of justice, will have to condemn you to a harsh and dreadful prison and must order the confiscation of your property. I am, however, inclined to clemency, and knowing the hardness of your case, I give you this option. <clears throat> if you freely plead guilty now, before the appointed trial, and commit yourself to only a few hours a day, of penal labor and to give regularly from the money still at your disposal such and such amount to charitable institutions, if you show by a good and law-abiding conduct that you have sincerely repented and seek mercy from me, when the day of trial arrives, I will very greatly reduce your sentence and if your disposition and satisfaction and good behavior warrant it, I will be glad to acquit you altogether at the trial. If, however, you plead not guilty and freely decline to do the satisfactory works I just proposed to you, <clears throat> then be you warned that you will be, you will unavoidably and avoidably have to suffer the full weight and rigor of justice and will be cast for a long time in a dreadful prison. Now is the time to make your choice. What do you choose? Of course, if the criminal was not a complete fool, he would wholeheartedly accept the merciful opportunity even him by the judge. And he would rightly be considered a fool if, if by only postponing a certain and imminent condemnation, he secures for himself a terrible sentence. Now each of us is, in a moral and spiritual sense, in a similar situation. Whenever one commits a mortal sin, he loses the grace and friendship of God and contracts a guilt before God that makes him deserving of the eternal punishment of hell. <clears throat> if, however, he recovers the state of grace by sacramental absolution or by perfect contrition with the desire of confession, <clears throat> He is no longer worthy of eternal punishment, as the guilt of mortal sin is removed. But he ordinarily retains a greater or lesser temporal punishment due to his forgiven mortal sins and for his venial sins. <clears throat> we all commit venial sins quite frequently. For, as the Holy Ghost says by the mouth of St. James, in many things we all offend. <clears throat> Each time we do commit a mortal sin, 
we, sin we increase the temporal punishment due to our sins, which we will have to suffer either here on earth or else in purgatory. <clears throat> we who have so often broken Christ's law by sinning are like the criminal which I described at the beginning. <clears throat> we have a great debt of punishment to pay to the divine justice of Christ, who knows all our sins, even the ones we have forgotten. <clears throat> The day, the hour, the very instant of our death has already been fixed by divine providence. Immediately after our soul shall have left the body, our Lord Jesus Christ will judge each of us. <clears throat> this particular judgment is the time of inexorable justice by which if we die in the state of grace, as we hope and pray, <clears throat> all the temporal punishment which we have accumulated throughout decades will have to be expiated in purgatory, which can be rightly compared to a most painful prison. For just as the sentenced criminal must remain in the prison, suffering great anguish, and being utterly unable to remedy or even to alleviate his pitiful condition, so also in purgatory we will be altogether unable to help ourselves, and we will have no other option than to suffer excruciating pains until the last farthing of our least venial sin be fully atoned for. <clears throat> The time of mercy in which the punishment due to our sins can and is greatly tempered by mercy is this present life. Once a particular judgment arrives, it is the time of facing the justice of God. <clears throat> now, in a way similar to the judge of the case used for our illustration, our Lord, in his ineffable mercy, does not cease to exhort us, to invite us by sermons, illuminations, and holy inspirations to be prudent and take advantage of the precious time of mercy before our approaching death. <clears throat> he would wish, because of the love he has for us, that we satisfy for our temporal punishment before the dread particular judgment, in which the just sentence shall be meted out. <clears throat> Here, the temporal punishment is paid off in a much easier and incomparably less severe way. For here, the sufferings are always mingled with some consolations or comforts, and they are rarely extremely severe. And even those rare kinds of pains do not last long. <clears throat> In purgatory, however, the suffering is always from entrance there even to the very last moment excruciating, much more painful than even the greatest pain of this earth. <clears throat> We must suffer for our sins, but here it is incomparably easier. Why would we postpone the sufferings only that they become harsher beyond comparison? When we try to escape, <clears throat> in a way contrary to the will of God, the suffering we deserve for our sins, for example, when we are impatient in sickness or adversity, <clears throat> we only double the sufferings. First, by adding more sins, as in the case of in impatience, thereby increasing the debt to be paid. Secondly, by postponing the pain to purgatory, instead of accepting it here, 
we suffer both the pain of the illness and the incomparably worse pains of purgatory, to atone for which this sickness was sent by providence. <laughs> and so, because of our fault, we suffer doubly. But if we accept our sickness with patience, we thereby reduce greatly the time of our purgatory. That we who have offended God by sin should not suffer is not an option. The only option is whether we will suffer much less in this life, <clears throat> receiving justice very much mitigated by mercy, <clears throat> or we will suffer much longer and much more under an incomparably heavier weight of justice. Whoever chooses the second option is truly a fool and does not even love himself as he ought, since he is being, in a certain sense, his worst enemy by piling for himself a most dreadful store of suffering that will await him after death if he saves his soul. <laughs> Besides, in this life, God most frequently remits more temporal punishment than the quantity of the suffering actually undergone would require, as, in the as is the case when satisfactory actions are done with a great love of God. For the more perfect our contrition, the greater will be the amount of the punishment remitted to us. Many sins are forgiven her, for she loved much, our Lord said of St. Mary Magdalene. And so it happens that by offering up sufferings that are in themselves rather light, but with a great love of God, we can cancel the suffering of a temporal punishment which corresponds in itself to a much, much greater suffering. But in purgatory, the punishment due is paid off in accordance with the rigor of justice and in proportion to its greatness. It is clear then that we should strive to pay all the temporal punishment due to our sins before we die. But how do we do so? We do so by performing the penances enjoined on us by the priest in confession, by satisfactory works voluntarily undertaken, such as prayer, fasting, alms deeds, and other pious acts, also by bearing patiently the punishments inflicted on us by God's providence, such as sickness, adversity, and the like, and especially by accepting willingly, as due to our sins, our own death, and finally by gaining indulgences. Now, one of the best means to greatly reduce our own time in purgatory is to pray for the souls now there, especially having masses said for them and attending at mass for their relief, and saying the rosary for them and offering up some sacrifices, sufferings, and alms or works of mercy for their relief. <laughs> This is indeed one of the most efficacious means to reduce our own purgatory because it is an excellent act of charity, which is so pleasing to God as to move him most efficaciously to remit our own debts, if not because of his justice, certainly on account of his mercy. The best way then to secure Christ's mercy for us is to have mercy for his suffering members in purgatory. For this reason, St. Alphonsus de Liguori exhorts us. 
I beseech you to apply to the souls in purgatory as many indulgences as you can. Fear not that, in consequence of applying them to these holy souls, you shall have to suffer the temporal pains due to your sins. Father Rossignoli, continues the saint, states that at, at the hour of death, Saint Gertrude was afflicted at having done nothing for her own soul. For she applied all the good that she had done to the souls in purgatory. Jesus Christ appeared to her and said, Gertrude, be comforted, for your charity to the souls in purgatory has been so pleasing to me that at death you shall escape purgatory and shall be accompanied to heaven by all my beloved spouses, that is, the souls whom your suffrages have delivered from purgatory. Let us then pray fervently for the repose of our deceased friend in Christ, remembering that our Lord has said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.